Beautiful, Leonard. So good to have you here today. Always good to have you here. And uh, what an appropriate song. You know, in unity, we value the mind. And in fact, in the unity that I grew up with, we emphasized the mind. It was important in those days that we be holding a clear vision for our life, that we use our mind to control our thoughts and what we said so that everything was speaking to the positive and in support of the vision for our life that we held. Things have changed a little bit in the way we view spirituality and unity, but there's no question that we need mind in order to effectively live in this world. And yet, we can't divorce heart from mind and have a full life experience. It is the marriage of our mind and our heart that gives us the full human experience that makes us actually uniquely human. And how beautiful today on this Valentine's Day that we are going to be exploring the heart and what heart brings to our life experience. We're working with Elizabeth Lesser's book, Broken Open. And I love the subtitle of this book, How Difficult Times Can Help Us Grow. So important. And in the pages that we are reading for this week, page 39 through 58, as I reviewed the material, looked at the examples that Elizabeth offered, they spoke to me of not only the importance but the role that love and the heart play in our life experience and in experiencing the fullness, the potential of the fullness in our life experience. It might be helpful before we jump into the heart to explore some of the qualities of the head or what we call the head center where the mind resides. There are definitely qualities of spirit that manifest through the head. Qualities like clarity, like brilliancy. Let me see what some of the others are. I wrote down, oh, here they are. Uh, clarity, brilliancy, crispness, discernment, precision. These are all qualities that can manifest in the head and qualities that definitely support us in life. But if we're disconnected from our heart, then those qualities tend to align with our ego perspective, our ego orientation. And they are going to be used to help us to control our life, to make sure that we survive, to make sure that life, that, that, that we are, let's see, what would the word be? What's the word that I'm looking for? Help us to maneuver through life instead of being in the flow of life or surrendering to life. The heart in comparison, the heart center, the spiritual heart, has qualities that, of course, we're going to recognize divine love and personal love, that personal love that we're celebrating today with Valentine's Day, but also joy is a quality of the heart. Compassion is a quality of the heart. Uh, you may be surprised to find out that strength and courage are qualities of the heart, that the will is also a quality of the heart. And these qualities rise in ways that when balanced with the mind, support us in ways that we may not attribute to the heart. For example, let's look at divine love. Do you know that divine love is the quality of our true nature that allows us to see that the nature of everything is good? Now, you may not have had that realization. You may not have, you know, had that sort of awakening to, oh my gosh, everything is good. 
But your true nature is always functioning. Maybe under the radar, because you're not awake to it yet, but always holding that truth that the nature of everything is good. Doesn't mean that horrific things don't happen in the world. Doesn't mean that horrific things don't happen to us. And with that deep knowing that everything is good, then what arises for us is trust and faith. Faith in our true nature, faith in God. Faith in our truth in the moment. Faith in our heart's longings. Faith in the direct knowing that we receive and the guidance that we receive. And that faith then allows us to grow, allows us to soften our need to be in control of our life, to be in charge, and allows us to open to the lessons and the opportunities for growth that life offers. It can be surprising in all the ways that that can benefit us. There's a story in the Bible that I think illustrates this well. It happens, I'm gonna be referring to uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. And in those and in, that, in those references, uh, we're told that uh, a Canaanite woman approached Jesus, and, and the disciples are with Jesus, and she is asking Jesus to heal her daughter, who it says in the Bible is possessed with the devil. A few of the narratives I read said probably we're describing some kind of mental illness there, something that th those days they couldn't quite explain, but today we would be able to explain. Now, just as a point of clarification, the Canaanite people were of a lower class than the Israelite people. They were less than. And so Jesus doesn't even acknowledge her presence. He just keeps walking on. And after a while, she persists, and after a while, some of the disciples say to Jesus, can you please ask her to leave? She is bothering us. I'd be curious to know about their orientation to their hearts <laughs> and to compassion. But Jesus responds with this. Let me just turn the page. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so he's saying, hey, I'm supposed to be working with the Israelites and I don't need to be working with you. You're not included in the group that I am here for. Now, I want you to just put yourself in this woman's shoes. All her life, she's been told that she is less than another group of people, the Israelites, and there may have been other layers and sects, I don't know. She is reaching out to a gentleman who is in the privileged group. If we were in this day and time, we could think of her as being woman, for sure. That would definitely be a group that tends to be held one step down in our culture. She might be black or of color. She might be a lesbian. She might be all three. And she is reaching out to a white man. Now, that's in today's culture. Um, hopefully you don't think that Jesus was white. That would, that would have not, uh, well, that just simply wouldn't have been true <laughs> where Jesus <laughs> lived in, the, in those times. And how would you respond 
if you asked of this man that was being held out as a healer, was being held out as a great teacher, was supposedly teaching a message that everyone was equal and that the kingdom of heaven was available to all people, and yet first he ignores you and then second he tells you that he's not here for your kind. Would you be angry? Would you collapse? and walk away with your tail between your legs, allowing your judge to beat you up for even having the idea that you could approach this man. And yet, listen to what happens for this woman as we pick up the narrative. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. My God, yet another slap in the face, you know. I am not going to take my energy, my teachings for the promised people and waste them on you. Again, fascinating that she's not reacting, right? She simply seems to be responding. And she comes back and says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. What's happening here? We begin to see the power of the heart for you see, as we are able to align with our heart, not cut our heart off, as we're able to open to and balance it with our mind, this trust in spirit, this trust in true nature actually allows us to not be impacted by what's going on in the world around us or how we're being treated or how we're being seen, or how we're being received. Instead, the alignment of the heart is with the truth, whichever, whatever that truth, whatever that truth in the moment is, it's in alignment with our guidance, it's in alignment with our heart's desires, it's unfettered by what's going on or what we're being told. It's strong, it's courageous, and yet it's not it's not like the ego's strength or courageous. It doesn't dig its heels in. It's got wisdom. Wisdom that balances it, that uses both the direct knowing of spirit and our learned knowing of the mind. And so Jesus is right. You know, he's testing this woman because it, that was out of character for Jesus, right? But he's testing her. How aligned are you with the very vessel that will bring you to the kingdom of heaven? It turned out she was very aligned. What does he say? Great is your faith. Great is your trust in your true nature. And thus, you are opening to all the potential that is the Christ within you, which in this story meant a healing. It doesn't always mean exactly what we think it's going to mean. And yet it's always bringing us to greater and greater good, greater and greater fulfillment. And there's other qualities that emerge from this alignment with the heart. Like, for example, innocence. And when I say innocence, in some ways I mean the innocence of a child. And that if you watch a toddler, a young child, they just take the world in. They're open to whatever. They're bright-eyed. They have no ideas about what's dangerous or what's not dangerous. They are not what they should be afraid of, what they're going to fail at, or what they're going to succeed at. They are just open to life and taking life in. And yet, this innocence is not exactly the innocence of a child because it lacks the ignorance of a child. You see, it comes with it 
all of that faith and trust and our wisdom. With that innocence, we can be open. And Elizabeth Lesser talks about needing a, what does she talk about? A beginner's mind, I almost said a child's mind. A beginner's mind. Well, it's the same thing as that innocence that comes from the heart. She points out that if we're an expert in something, we have cut off some of the potential because we already know. (laughs) We already know. But you see, in innocence, we don't need to know. We trust that the guidance, that the direct knowing, balanced with our wisdom, will come in the moment, will guide us to our good. And for that, then, We don't need to be obsessed with not making a mistake or doing it right. And the field of possibilities opens in a way that's unimaginable to our ego. In the same way, in the very last chapter that's assigned, the very last segment of reading, we're opened up to her next section, which is called the Phoenix Process, this ability to take the pieces when our life seemingly has fallen apart or in some area where it's fallen apart and to put them together again. And do you see how this innocence and this uh, trust and faith and the wisdom and all these qualities that we're talking about from the heart, they allow us to enter into that, not needing to know how we're going to come back together, not needing to know what's going to happen, because we have a deep faith that everything is working towards bringing greater good, that there is incredible potential that we can't even dream of for our life, that's being revealed here. The heart is a powerful tool for us in opening up, in being the light, in allowing our lives to manifest in (laughs) untold potential. You know, and so the question becomes, why aren't we all then highly balanced in heart and mind? Why is it that most of us come into life after a few years favoring the mind. Well, that rascal of a heart also feels deeply. It is the part of us that feels both the intensity of the pain of life and the the joy and the bliss of life. And when we were kids, that was more than we could handle. And so our ego forms beautifully and in in an important way to develop defenses that protect us from overwhelming ourselves with feeling. Those defenses can take many different forms. For some of us, if we sense into it, it's as if we have a rubber or a steel plate surrounding our heart. Or some people, we're just totally cut off at the heart center. We can feel our belly. We can feel the activity of our head. But uh, there's no real experience happening in the heart. The other piece is that the heart is like a wild card. You see, the heart is aligned with the truth. It doesn't really have much concern about whether we're going to be safe or whether we feel comfortable. (laughs) It's no respecter of men, as the Bible says. It's all about the truth because the heart trusts the truth. And so to the ego, you know, it's like, oh, my God, shut that thing down. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. You know, it's... Let's just stay away from that. In fact, I like what, uh, yeah, there it is. Elizabeth Lesser writes on page 39, 
Many people are scared to death of their deeper nature. <laughs> Most of us are scared to death of our deeper nature. Come on, let's face it. And maybe not in all areas of our lives, but in that, in those, uh, what do we call it? The shadowy areas, right? Where we haven't really wanted to look. And the challenge is, that remember, on that other side, it's on the heart side that we tend to be cut off, not in every area of our life. This really cool thing about the ego is it, it's not like it's a blanket over our entire life. There will be parts of our life where we really can allow the flow of spirit. But then there'll be other areas where we're constricted, where we don't want to go there, where we need to be in charge. And in those areas, it's uh, really scary to take that step. You know, Elizabeth says the, the step to opening to our heart is to feeling our feelings. But without the courage and the strength and the trust, it feels like we're throwing ourselves off a cliff at times. It's scary. It's challenging. She tells the story of a woman named Karen. She tells actually the story of a couple of uh, women's stories that are very touching to me. But in this story of Karen, what does she say about Karen? I love, oh, she's result, uh, resolutely cheerful. <laughs> she's, and, and you can imagine, so this woman has uh, become a dancer, but she's lived this kind of charmed life. She was a, a world-class athlete. She, everything she touched, you know, was sort of golden. And she, her feeling was, you know, if I just hold, if I just hold a positive attitude about things, the universe will take care of me. And she attends one of Elizabeth's workshops, but she sort of balks at the idea that you've got to feel your pain. You know, it's interesting. That is a, a direct road into the heart. Are you willing to trust your guidance? Are you willing to feel the feelings that come up, no matter what the feelings are? And she stays in touch with Elizabeth. In fact, Elizabeth talks about the fact that she sort of dances in an orbit around Elizabeth, popping in every once in a while into Elizabeth's life, maybe taking another workshop, but never letting herself go into the pain. What would that be? If you remember, if you've been with us for the last few talks, that's the activity of her soul, right? The ego is strong in us, very strong in us, or it can be. But the soul is persistent. It is sort of a, a gentle energy in us that is, yes, and I want to experience more. I want to see what the possibilities are. And so that soul of hers just kept her in Elizabeth's orbit. And unfortunately for Karen, she didn't break open. She wasn't able to take that leap off. And, and illness set in for her. Life began to fall apart. And uh, Elizabeth would stay in touch with her a few times, and she would always say, no, 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 I'm, you know, God will take care of me. And in the end, uh, a friend called Elizabeth, a friend of Karen's called Elizabeth and said, uh, I'm really worried for Karen. And when Elizabeth got off the phone with her, against Karen's wishes, she called an ambulance. And the doctors at the hospital told Karen that if Elizabeth hadn't called, she would have died. And that broke Karen open to the point that Karen was able to get real about what was going on with her life. I want to point out also how much alignment Elizabeth had with her heart it's not easy when someone directly forbids you from calling an ambulance. And yet, despite what's going on in the world around you, your guidance, your truth in the moment, your direct knowing, whatever it is, however it manifests, says call the ambulance. And you do. 
It's not black and white. It is an in-the-moment experience of the heart. For the heart knows. I love that Elizabeth writes, how odd that if we reject what is painful, we find only more pain. But if we embrace what is within us, if we peer fearlessly into the shadows, we stumble upon the light. And as I said, those first few times of doing that are incredibly scary because those qualities that support us in fearlessly turning towards the shadows are the qualities of the heart, the very thing that our ego doesn't trust. And so the answer for us as we are working to balance our alignment with both the mind and the heart is this willingness to feel. And Elizabeth has a beautiful thing to say in a piece that was sent to me this week by uh, Lee Apner. This is not from uh, Broken Open, but instead from an article that Elizabeth wrote called Facing the Grief Gathering in Our Hearts, where the gist of this article is her realizing how much grief she has around the changes that have occurred in her life because of the pandemic. And in one of the paragraphs, she writes this. When I was writing the book, Broken Open, How Difficult Times Can Help Us Grow, I interviewed many people who had not only survived devastating loss, but ultimately had grown wiser and stronger. I also talked with people who had not been transformed by loss, but instead had become bitter and defeated. What made the difference? Those who feign strength or detachment in the face of a profound loss shut down all of their feelings. Not only grief, but also resilience, hope, and courage. In other words, they cut off from their heart. Those who stayed connected to their feelings finally emerged, even if it took them a long time, able to forge a new creative path. It's not easy to really trust our feelings in the moment, trust that we can handle them. And in fact, in the beginning, they may flood us. They may be challenging. All of the aspects of our spirituality need to be developed, or maybe what we should say is our consciousness needs to be developed to be able to fully use those in a mature and fully possible way. And yet the payoff is terrific. <clears throat> I serve on the board of Unity World Headquarters and we were in a board meeting this week. And speaking of grief, a dear friend of mine passed away suddenly five weeks ago. And in these board meetings, we take time with the leadership team to talk to them about what we see that's going well in the organization. And so I had received one of, the, of Unity's newest products. It's called a Time to Grieve. They send all of the new products out to us board members. This was so timely for me. And as I'm feeling now, as I told the executive team how much this deck of cards has been helping me through the process, I began to cry. And you know, I went through my you know how it is, there's a part of me that knows it's okay to cry, but still, after some time and bringing the whole meeting, which is 20 people, to a complete grinding halt, 
My judge was on me. Come on, pull it together. What's going on here, you know? But a couple of things that I noticed when I was able to focus again through the tears, I saw that six or seven people were crying with me. But afterwards, I received a, a beautiful email from, it turns out, uh, one of the people of, a, of the three members of the executive team that had this idea for this deck of cards. By the way, um, I don't think we have them in the bookstore yet, but I would encourage you, if they've just been amazing, they're very simple, and yet they've really helped me stay on top of my grief, to not write it off, to just stay right with it. I got this beautiful email saying, you know, we had this idea for these cards and, and we've received some feedback on them, but your willingness to cry with us really demonstrated for us that they work. That the very idea that we had was having impact on the people that we serve. And I realized that so often, you know, I think that my feelings are just my feelings and that my expression of them is, is just for me. It's not really having impact on the world. But what I got to see was that through my willingness, at least what this woman seemed to be mirroring back to me was through my willingness to be with my feelings in the moment that it gave them support for their creative process, for their uh, ideas that were forming in them that sometimes she said were hard to trust, to be taking people to difficult places. Life is a mystery. Sometimes in our life, we're going to be able to accept the invitation to move towards our heart, to feel the difficult feelings, but in that to open up to all that the heart has to offer. At other times, we're not. And yet the beauty of this universe that we live in is that inevitably something will unfold that will break us open. My invitation to you today is Let's not wait. If we're willing to feel the feelings that are coming up in the moment, if we're willing to take a step towards that guidance that we're receiving, to that uh, truth that we feel uh, firmly in our heart, to that direct knowing that can arise, yes, it's going to be scary, unnerving, but it invites us to align with our heart and to bring our heart and mind back into balance. And from that place, to experience the potential of life, the fulfillment and satisfaction of life, what it means to be truly human. Let's spend some time now in some meditation. I want you to, I want to invite you to take a nice deep breath. Again, as I have been doing through this program, through this book study, I want to orient us towards bringing our focus to something other than the activity of our mind. The mind is also the home of the ego. To recognize that we can trust the quiet stillness, the spaciousness of the heart. And so I invite you to bring your attention to the movement of your breath in and out of your chest or to that center of gravity in our body that's called the cost center 
two fingers in and three fingers down from our belly button in that general area. With COVID, I think it's a few more fingers in for me. <laughs> to allow yourself to just simply focus on the gentle movement or the stillness. We'll rest together in the silence. I will be coming in to gently bring you back, but for now, we rest in the spacious stillness. And again, I invite you back, back to the focus on your breath in and out in your chest or to that quiet stillness of the cough, no judgment. Just simply come back. Mm -hmm. 